and welcome to Design Week 2022. My name is Clifford Swartz and I'll be your host today. Today's topic is connectivity and embedded solutions. Before we introduce our wonderful guests and get down to the topic, I'm going to throw it over to Nate in the booth and he's going to tell all of you wonderful people how to participate. How are you doing, Nate? Hello, good. Thanks, Clifford. So welcome to Design Week Day 1. So Design Week is a three-day event we have where we talk about the latest and greatest in tech and at Microchip. We are broadcasting from YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So please like, comment, subscribe, follow, favorite, bookmark, etc. And please send it to your friends, your friends' friends, and your friends' grandmas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, actually my, uh, my parents are watching, so hi mom, hi dad. And uh, any questions you have, please leave them in chat. And if, if we don't get to your question, we can email it to livestream at microchip.com. Cool. Thank you very much. And hello to Nate's mom as well. Um, on my screen right now, we have the website for Design Week. Uh, it's a wonderfully laid out. And if you click register now, you are taken to the On24 platform where you can see all of the different webinars and talk tracks that engineers all over Microchip and all over the globe have uh, prepared for you guys. So the content does not end when this live stream does. We, uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff planned for you throughout these next three days. But I'd like to introduce my guest. To my left, we have JR. How are you doing, JR? I'm doing well. Thank you, Clifford. Of course. To his left, we have Alexis. Hello, Alexis. Hi, Clifford. Thanks for having us today. Always. Through the power of the internet, we have Christina uh, from Mauser. How are you doing, Christina? I'm doing good, how are you? I am lovely. And then finally, we have Nick DeRosa, who's going to tell all of you what an edge node is. So take it away, Nick. Thanks, Clifford. An edge node is the part of the connected system that senses, measures, and collects data, and then uses smart computing functions to control <coughs> and manipulate the environment. These nodes are co-located to the conditions being monitored or the devices being controlled. The node is the intersection between the tangible physical world and the digital virtual world. Edge nodes are connected to the system via wired or wireless connection. Either way you choose to connect, you are now enabled to collect data, analyze it, and then execute smart actions locally in real time using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Imagine being able to predict when a bearing is about to fail in your robotic arm on your factory floor. You can minimize your lines down while swapping out a replacement bearing before the failure, maximizing your factory's utilization, profitability, and revenue. What it also enables you to do is to spread out your compute resources and reduce the amount of data you have to send off-site, like to a data center. The goal is to make as many local, time-sensitive decisions as possible, and then when necessary, relay that information up to the cloud, which is where you can see the entire system at a high level and make macro decisions based on the status of the system as a whole. It's all about architecting and optimizing where your compute resources are physically located so you can have a more efficient connected system. That is just a brief explanation of what an edge node is. Back to you, Clifford. I love it. Thank you very much, Nick. So, to start us off, I'm going to ask a question to JR. What is edge compute and where the edge actually is? That is a fantastic question, and uh, it really depends on who you ask, because um, the edge is relative to the entire ecosystem of the, of the Internet of Things. So, if you ask a cloud person, you know, where the edge is, the edge is an, an extension of the radius of a cloud infrastructure, of a data center, to become co-located to the physical world, uh, to be able to make some of that local uh, decision making that Nick that Nick spoke about. Gotcha. Now, from the embedded perspective, the edge, um, an end node like you're going to be showing later on, really is a, it's a single physical device, usually single purpose, and it's controlled by other things. Maybe that edge control is right co-located with it. Uh, maybe it's up in the cloud, and so from that perspective, uh, the edge is in between the cloud and it, and so the edge actually is in the middle nice. of an IoT ecosystem. Cool. Thank you very much. And so, with so many different uh, types of IoT applications, what do they all sort of share in common with each other? So, uh, excellent. So, the IoT Edge Compute ecosystem, it's really it's kind of a series of orbits of data. You've got the physical world where you do sensing and control. Um, if there are local conditions, ambient conditions, or conditions like a bearing on a motor, vibration, all of that physical information then needs to get to the cloud to be aggregated with other pieces of information. We've all heard the term big data. Mm -hmm. And so big data is really just a collection, an ordered collection of little data that you can gather and you can make uh, business level decisions. You can have basically this future-based data 
fortune teller uh, in, up in the cloud in the blue, um, where you can really implement some, some business objects that will help, uh, help drive innovation, help drive operational efficiencies, increases of yields and factories, um, and safety as well. And so all of this depends on uh, getting that data from the physical to the virtual. Right. And so Microchip's field of play in our role really is enabling the device makers, enabling our customers, you, uh, to be able to create these devices to do sensing and control um, at that physical level of the physical world, uh, operate with local and edge compute, processing microcontrollers, uh, local decision making, even, even tiny implementations of AI and ML on that data. And then there's wired and wireless connectivity and endpoint security uh, that then will transfer that data up to the cloud where real business decisions can be made. Cool, thank you very much. So let's talk a little bit about some of the requirements and challenges that an IoT application may face. Uh, Alexis? Yeah, there's a lot of different requirements in an IoT application, and um, it, it starts with the, the sensor, uh, uh, as he was talking about. Um, and so you can have the sensor bringing data up to the cloud, or you can have um, commands and control coming back down to the sensor. Um, in addition, you need it to be low power. Nobody wants to change batteries, so you want the battery life to last as long as possible. Um, form factor is very important. Um, in m many of these IoT edge node uh, applications are um, in very space constrained designs. So you want to make sure that the, the size is, is appropriate. Um, the applications need to be both responsive and reliable uh, in, in their communication. Uh, security is another key element, making sure all the data is, is secured. And of course, everything needs to be cost effective. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> do you guys mind walking us through sort of a uh, overview of how the data is transferred? How does it get to the cloud and what does the whole system look like? Sure, so it, it really does start with, with sensing. And so uh, whether you're sensing temperature, vibration, energy, um, that, that signal path is really where everything originates. Um, once we have that, that data sensed fast and accurately, it usually gets passed over to some type of controller. Um, so whether it's a, a very simple requirement um, for a kind of low cost, um, very simple sensor edge node that an 8-bit microcontroller can take care of, um, all the way up to very, very high performance needs at the edge um, uh, with 32-bit microcontrollers or microprocessors, all of that scalability <coughs> is possible within um, the same microchip development tool ecosystem. And you can't forget about security. Absolutely. So from there, the Internet of Things <clears throat> is younger than the Internet, and the Internet was there first. And so these things must conform to these established security protocols uh, on the Internet, X509 certificates, public key infrastructure, et cetera. And so offering that security at the very beginning with a minimum viable product um, <clears throat> or a proof of concept is very important. So you've got authentication, TLS, uh, stream ciphers like AES, et cetera, uh, trusted platform modules, as well as hardware secure elements. Uh, to secure that data and secure private keys. Uh, very important. And very important to begin with that in mind. And then when the data is secured, the connections are authenticated. Um, it's all about getting the data up to the cloud. And through that, the physical means you can have wired communication, wireless communication. Uh, there's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 802.15.4 technologies, as well as some LP WAN, like, uh, like LoRa. <clears throat> and then wired uh, Ethernet, 10Base T1S, all of these mechanisms to get that data up to the cloud. Where we have very established cloud partners like Microsoft Azure IoT, AWS IoT, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, from there, that's when that blue level um, of some of that real visualizations of aggregated data can really take place and, and make a big difference. And I believe we have a question from the booth. Nate? All right, so uh, first question of the day. So. What are the new cost-effective <coughs> solutions from Design Week 2022? So uh, some of the newer uh, cost-effective solutions for, for IoT are, are, are IoT boards. And we'll, we'll go into a lot of detail about those in a little bit. Um, but we do have uh, IoT boards for all of the different uh, micro, microchip microcontroller portfolio, ranging from the 8-bit the PIC, PIC microcontrollers, 16-bit uh, microcontrollers, 32-bit uh, SAM microcontrollers, so there is a, a wide range of, of cost-effective boards available. 
Um, they also connect to all the different clouds. And so um, we'll talk through the partnerships that, that we have with um, all of the, the major cloud providers as well. Absolutely. And on the desk right in my hand, we have an example. I believe this is the Aver IoT AWS board. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing a live demo for you guys later. So stay tuned for that. Uh, thank you very much, Nate. So bringing it back, uh, JR, earlier you mentioned about the physical world, and that's where I imagine the actual sensing and control takes place. But do you mind talking to me a little bit about where the data is gathered? Yeah, so um, IoT is a system uh, that often starts with an embedded system that's always in one single location. But when you create an IoT device, it's not just a device, it's a whole ecosystem. Um, and you need these different orbits of processing from local all the way up to the cloud and the cloud partners. With wireless communication, very, very popular for, for IoT, um, we kind of look at three different things, range, speed, and power. All are very important. Um, size and power consumption are very important on the embedded side, as oftentimes it's, because it is in the physical world, its physical dimensions do matter. Right. Um, and its maintainability matters with power consumption. The amount of data, of course, is going to um, really indicate what your speed requirements are, um, and then also range. You know, if it's an LP WAN system, uh, LoRa or otherwise, you can have longer range. But with these three items, one needs to be sacrificed, and so two out of three ain't bad. Of if you want low power and long range, you can get that at the at the expense of speed. Also, if you want speed and range, uh, that's going to be at the expense of power. So, we kind of take a look at each system and each system needs to be architected and optimized for its goals. Cool, thank you very much. Oh, and I think we have another question from the booth, Nate. All right, one second, let me just real quick. Uh, of okay. course. So <coughs> is sensing input limited to non-vision sensing inputs? Throw that over to you guys. Non-vision sensing inputs. So usually the sensing um, is something like a temperature, um, a physical parameter. A physical right. parameter, something that, that's physical. So um, non-vision, I guess, what would a vision parameter be? So sensing presence, things like... Um, if you were color sensing or other yeah. things like that. Yeah. I, I don't know if we have, if Microelectronica has that in their portfolio or not. We'll the, have to look into that. Microelectronica does have a color sensing click. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we have a library or driver to support it, but uh, natively you can write any code you want and uh, it will work seamlessly. Another vision sensing technology in factory uh, areas that, that is very popular um, for safety reasons is object recognition. Of course, yeah. You know, is there an obstacle in the way of where a forklift should be driving? Mm -hmm. um, rather than having some sort of a pressure sensor or ultrasonic, you can have a vision system that, occupy, that can have a, a wide field of view mm -hmm. and really understand whether or not the area is safe. So really, whatever the sensor is, as long as the data is <coughs> in a format that can um, that can go into the, the controller. The, the system is very scalable and flexible. So I, I think if the sensor exists, it can be integrated in, into the, the IoT application. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you'd scale the processing to accommodate what that is. If it's vision, you're going to need more processing. and right. we'll have Lots a, more memory. Yeah. Lots <laughs> more memory. Yep, no doubt. Cool. Well, thank you guys very much for the questions. Uh, moving back to uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So I know that analog integration has evolved over the year, years, not years. Do you <laughs> mind walking me through how Microchip has been there with it? Sure. So um, the, the analog portion or the, the signal chain is, is a really important part of the sensing and control of, of an IoT edge node. And there's, there's pros and cons to having that either integrated into your microcontroller or having it discrete. Um, oftentimes, the discrete components can have um, higher specifications, um, and sometimes they have more flexible power rails. Um, and there may be some specialty variants that, that make it worth using a, a discrete version um, instead of an integrated one. But over the past 10 years, uh, we're integrating more and more of the advanced analog into the microcontroller. Um, so things like 16-bit um, uh, Sigma Delta analog to digital converters, uh, very fast SAR analog to digital converters, uh, comparators, PGAs, op amps, all of those are, are analog uh, components that used to be only available discrete, um, but now you can find integrated into the microcontroller portfolio. Uh, the biggest advantage there is it, it saves you in the bomb cost, but it also saves your, your board size. And like we mentioned in the requirements section, the, the size constraints are, are, are a big factor, so that can be really helpful. Cool, thank you very much. And so data drives the outcome. Do you mind telling me what drives the next decision in this chain? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I, I think really the, the next thing is the microcontroller. So you need sure. some, uh, you have this data, now you gotta uh, analyze it and do something with it. Um, so when it comes to that, uh, depending what the sensor is and what the, um, the real requirements are in terms of performance, uh, Microchip has a, a really broad portfolio of, um, of microcontrollers and, and scalable performance. Uh, we, we like to talk about that you can, uh, our IoT solutions uh, have any core and, and any cloud. And, and, and as you can see in the, in the picture here, really when we say any, any core, we really mean it. Absolutely. So everything from um, on the 8-bit the side, we've got good low cost, uh, low power controllers with both the PIC and the AVR families. Um, if you run out of headroom there and need a little bit more performance and uh, memory, the 16-bit microcontrollers are a good fit. Uh, if you need real uh, real time uh, response and low latency, the DSPIC uh, digital signal controller family uh, is helpful in those type of IoT applications. Some customers move up into the 32-bit space, and we cover both the proprietary as well as the ARM cores with right. our 32-bit controllers. Uh, the range there gets up to about 600 MIPS, uh, and if you need even more, they've got microprocessors as well as FPGAs. And that would be, you know, if we were um, doing kind of the, the machine learning and AI at the edge, uh, you'd have plenty of, of performance um, in those families. Across the whole portfolio, um, there's smart peripherals integrated to try and uh, offload the CPU when needed. And you can see in the picture there's some, some overlap in, in the, the various families, and that's an intentional part of our strategy um, to make sure that you don't have to jump from one family to another, that there is some nice overlap there to make that migration seamlessly, uh, seamless as your requirements change. I dig it, thank you. So, uh, now that we've gathered the data, how do we actually secure it and protect it before sending it out into the world? That is a very, very good question. It's, it's super timely. Um, now that devices are becoming connected, security is not an option. Um, back when, when devices were unconnected, the security was provided really by your door lock, really to prevent p intruders coming in and doing a physical attack on the physical piece of equipment. And so that threat surface was, was pretty small. And then when you connect it, the threat service extends to the entire internet uh, that could connect to um, hijack a uh, embedded device uh, in order to secure your own brand and secure your customers. Security must start at the beginning. Gotcha. So with the prototype, uh, you're going to show that board in a bit. Um, at the very beginning, you need to have production grade security uh, with your minimum viable product. Absolutely. So data at rest is worthless. What do we actually do to get data to the cloud? How do we give it legs? Yeah, so those legs uh, are provided over as I had mentioned, wired or wireless communication, um, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, 802.15.4, all of that data needs to get transported. As you mentioned, data has very little value if it's just sitting there at the physical area where it was collected because it's no mystery what that condition was right, right there. And so it really in order to get it to where it needs to be from multiple locations to a single co-located area where it can, um, where the business value can be derived out of that data, you need these mechanisms. And from USB to 15.4 and other mechanisms, uh, that is really the transport. That's the, uh, that's the train <laughs> that brings the data to the station. Very cool, and so what is that station? What is the final destination for our data? So the final destination is a business outcome. Um, and so really, uh, it really just costs money to put data all together. And if you're not going to do anything with it, um, well then it's, it's uh, it's, it's a little bit fruitless. And so you need to get it all aggregated into and make some big data decisions. And in order to do that, uh, with security kind of at the center of, of this uh, three-legged deal, um, any core, any cloud, anywhere, um, from as Alexis had mentioned, from 8-bit up through uh, FPGAs um, and S SOCs, and then the transport layer, um, you know, and physical layers of, of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and Ethernet 15.4. And then any cloud. Um, and to be able to operate up there, there's a lot of different skill sets that are required. Uh, Microsoft Azure IoT Central is a great option to make things really quick um, and visualize your data fast and integrate different things. My, uh, Amazon AWS IoT and Google Cloud Platform, um, the things industries are all areas where uh, customers can do some real innovation in the cloud um, to be able to get value out of that data. Cool, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so what sort of help does Microchip provide uh, developers that want to get into this? 
We have our, our IoT development boards that can be very helpful for rapid prototyping. Uh, they come with demo code that, that works out of the box to connect to the cloud really easily. Um, but it also includes um, uh, the ability to customize and, and add other sensors. Uh, so the, the board that you see here has um, both light and temperature sensing, uh, as well as the ability to add in um, many other sensors and, and customize your design. Very cool. And before we move on to the live demo, which I'm sure you guys are very excited for, I think we have another question from the booth. Nate, take it away. All right. So this one's actually directed at JR, but uh, does Microchip have plans to support the Matter protocol for wireless communication? Yes, that is, a, that is a good question. An emerging protocol called Matter, um, based on either a Wi-Fi technology or an 802.15.4 technology, um, is something that's in the works. It's had a couple of almost false starts of release, and right now the current projected schedule for the, the Matter protocol spec is the fall of 2022. Uh, and we're currently uh, looking into the support for that. We've got a new product that we just released that is a microcontroller with integrated 802.15.4 and Bluetooth. And so that uh, naturally would be an excellent pro, uh, platform for Matter, uh, as well as any of our Wi-Fi devices uh, for Matter over, over traditional TCP IP. Cool. Thank you very much. And I will just say that that was the perfect amount of time for me to plug in the board and actually get it connected to the internet. So thank you very much for Nate asking the question and for the viewers to also ask that question. So on my screen, you will see a website, a beautiful little landing page and sandbox for this uh, particular development board. When you plug in this board to your computer, it acts as sort of like a um, flash drive. So it's a file location they can actually go inside, and there is a file called ClickMe. Once you click that, it takes you directly to this page. This page is unique to each board that you have. And on it, just an example, there is a light sensor and a temperature sensor. And so if I were to close it in my hand, we will see light go down and temperature go up. So I am healthy, and that is good. Uh, furthermore, you can play with this. You can add other sensors if you'd like. If you notice on the board itself, we have soldered on these wonderful little headers. And so earlier, we talked about Microelectronica. They use the Microbus footprint, which is this exact form. And so basically, any of the clicks that you'd like, you can just add to this, and uh, it'll work pretty seamlessly. So uh, check it out. It's pretty cool. Going back to the presentation, so you talked a little bit earlier about adding your own uh, customizable code. How does somebody actually do that? So the, um, the, the board does come with demo code out of the box that will help connect to the cloud. Um, and uh, if you want to customize your end application, all of that code's available in our MPLAB code configurator or MCC tool. Um, if you want to add additional code snippets, you can look into the Discover tool, which there's a, a lot of other code available there to integrate in your design. And the IDE is available um, supporting all of these IoT boards, either um, in the downloadable free version or the, the cloud-based Express IDE. Very cool. And so I think we have another question. Nate, what is it? OK, so uh, another question we have is, is there a 5G option for uh, on the roadmap for these uh, IoT solutions? Oh. And uh, I'm actually going to take over for this one. Do I mentioned that we have an AI and machine learning live stream, which will actually touch on that tomorrow. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I dig it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of hardware is available if somebody wanted to get started just uh, right off the shelf? So there's, there's a lot of hardware options. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible for, for people to connect to the cloud and be comfortable with their um, the controller of their choice. And so there's, there's a lot of different options. We've got the three different cloud providers, um, Azure, AWS, and Google, and then all the different um, microcontroller options. Uh, so it's very scalable. Uh, we want people to, to be able to use the controller that they're comfortable with. Um, the, the boards are, are available um, through all of our, our partners and they include the security as well as the cloud connection so that you have a really easy uh, getting started. It, it was so easy, Clifford could do it in the it's time true. of one question. It was, uh, <coughs> it was difficult, but we did it. It was a success. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So, uh, moving to Christina from Mauser, what sort of content does Mauser provide, one of our partners, to uh, help people get started? Yes, so we actually do create uh, project articles around several of the microcontrollers provided by Microchip. And the first one um, is AI on the edge. So we use uh, Microchip's 32-bit microcontrollers and MP Lab X IDE to create a rap design and machine learning through several of the demo codes that are available. And we also created a custom code of our own that's available through our GitHub. Cool. 
And the next one is uh, connecting a variety of microchips MCUs to TensorFlow Lite uh, using a couple of the demo code provided. And then we also created um, a couple of others, uh, other examples provided on our GitHub also. And the very last project we created, um, it's using uh, the Microchip SAM D21 Curiosity Nano, and we connected that to Medium One, and this is a getting started to show you how easy it can be. I dig it, thank you guys very much, and this is uh, something that you guys add to semi sort of regularly, and so it's something to check back in. Yes. Very cool, thank you. Correct. So, what sort of resources does Microchip have to get uh, designers started, guys? So our, our customers are experts in their end applications. And so um, they have all the expertise in their areas like transportation, industrial, factory automation, medical devices. Um, and, and Microchip's products have been in all of these applications for, for years and years. Um, when they decide that they want to connect those applications up to the cloud, they might not necessarily have all of the expertise to be able to, to do that. So as we touched on, there are security requirements, um, the, the cloud requirements add um, some additional complexity, you know, even creating an app to be able to remotely com uh, control something might not be something that, that uh, they, they have the staff and expertise to do. So we do have a, a design partner program uh, with many consultants that are able to help our, our customers with these designs to help get to, to market faster. And uh, we have that network of people that um, are available um, in both security, um, they can help with the, um, the embedded part of the application, um, and they can also help with the, the back end uh, on the cloud. So those are our resources that, that we have available to customers um, across the portfolio so that they can innovate and bring great products to market. Cool, thank you very much. And so the last thing that I want to call attention to, well, oh, we have a question from the booth. Nate, take it away. All right, so this is a really good one. And I love it. Uh, I think we can direct this one to Christina, but uh, we have a question of where can I get this board for my lab? <laughs> so depending on which board it is, we probably we might have it in stock. So several of Microchip's MCUs we do carry in stock. Um, it, it just depends on which one you're referring to. And so we can drop a link in the chat, uh, specifically to Mauser, mm -hmm. for you guys to search for whatever particular board you're interested in. And uh, if you cannot find it, just email us, and I will get you in touch with Christina. Or um, if it's easy yep. enough for me to do, I will find out for you guys. And I think in, in the resources, too, we'll also have yes. some links that will link to the Design Center um, on Microchip's website that lists all the boards that are available and the part numbers. So that'll make the, the searching even easier. Absolutely. So you can find which cloud provider and which, um, uh, which microcontroller that, that you're looking for um, at that, that IoT website. And so the last slide that we have in the presentation for you guys is just a simple list of all the different URLs that uh, we were talking about and what we just mentioned. But if you go to our webpage, I believe I have them already pulled up, or I have some of them pulled up, you can just go to our IoT landing page, and then from here you'll be able to find, and you can also register for Design Week 2022 <laughs> if you are so inclined, but you can read about all of our different cloud partners and all the different boards that you can get. But uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Nate, if there are any other questions, I am ready and happy to hear them. All right, just give me a moment. Uh, no worries. And if you guys are furiously typing a comment, you can always uh, just copy and paste that into an email and send it to us at livestream at microchip.com, and uh, we will be sure to answer those. Okay, so here's a good one that I like. Uh, what hardware options does Microchip offer for increased security in IoT? Cool. You take that? Sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So for uh, deeply embedded designs, the ATECC 608 family uh, offers secure key storage as well as encryption hardware, uh, encryption calculations. Uh, so that is a, a fantastic device. Part of our trust platform design suite, and I believe we have a session on that uh, with, with Xavier later on yes, this we week. Do. Um, and so that device is, is wonderful for, for tiny embedded applications. We also have trust anchors, TA100, uh, TPM style. Uh, devices and so for your typical embedded IOT design you know the devices are great uh, the other ecosystem that we provide around that is this trust platform and so definitely tune in to that session uh, to learn more about how to do at scale um, uh, secure provisioning for your embedded devices absolutely any others Nate 
I think I'm all tapped out at this point. Cool, I dig it. Lots of good questions throughout the session, and once again, if you guys still want to ask something, just send us an email and I will be happy to uh, send that along or answer it myself. So, uh, that sort of brings us to the end of today's live stream, but I'd like to stress again that the event does not end after this live stream. Uh, if you go to microchip.com forward slash design week, you'll be taken to the page that I showed earlier and I'm showing again. And if you click this register now, it'll be very easy for you guys to suddenly gain access to a world of talk tracks. It is totally free, um, and please, a lot of people put a lot of uh, a lot of effort into this for you. So, uh, so check it out if you are so inclined. We do have another question, Nate. So uh, actually, so my mistake. So I just got a. So I have it from uh, one of our engineers that a, a couple questions on LinkedIn are actually covered in uh, our following webinar t um, live stream tomorrow. Absolutely. So uh, for those of you who have questions, particularly on LinkedIn, a number of them will address tomorrow. Very cool. And so speaking of tomorrow, tomorrow's live stream will be about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then the day after that, we'll be focusing on security and functional safety, or FUSA. So be sure to tune in for that if you guys are interested. But at this point, I'd like to give a huge thank you to all of my wonderful guests. You guys are wonderful. A uh, big thank you to everybody at home that is watching. Without you, this wouldn't be happening. Uh, thank you to Nate's mother and father for watching. <laughs> and um, I was going to add that. And you didn't. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will see you guys tomorrow. Stay happy, stay healthy, and thank you very much for tuning in. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Farewell. <laughs> we did it. Good work. We did. Mm -hmm. yeah.